welcome to the Transition Dialogue podcasts. My name is Alicia Pacevic. I'm an um, expert in education uh, at the Center for Citizenship Education in Poland. And uh, this is part of a project that we have started uh, some time ago with the participation of uh, countries from the uh, Eastern and Central Europe that have gone through transition from communism to, yes, we don't know exactly how to call the period we are in. Some countries say transition has ended in the 90s, it began in 1989 in Poland, but then went through the whole uh, Eastern and Central Europe. And some people say it has ended in the 90s or in the moment when some of our countries entered the European Union. But there are others who are saying that we are still in transition. And uh, it's very interesting and insightful to look into the period that we are going through. This is a very unique experience, the generational experience of not only one generation, the one that has brought um, the transition into life, but also all the um, generations that came later and are living the consequences of the, the tran political, social, economic transformation. This is the sort of a dream come true, not only from the political perspective of the uh, fall of communism, but also a sort of a dream come true for a historian, for a social psychologist, for a sociologist, this big wave of changes that happened uh, here is really something completely unique and not so easy to uh, understand. Some people call it a self-limiting revolution. Others say it was just, you know, one of the many social changes that uh, the humanity went through. Whatever the perspective you take, it's incredible to look into how in our countries, in different countries, in Poland, Lithuania, Germany, Bulgaria, Russia, Ukraine, how it was done and what are the big differences between our different ways of transition, but also what are the similarities, the general patterns that we can observe. But the goal of the um, Transition Dialogue Project is not really to find the historical truth about transition. It's more about teaching transition and talking on transition, how the knowledge and perceptions of transition are formed and how they are then uh, spread and what is the relation, for example, between public discourse on uh, what has happened in our countries and how it's then taught in the schools. So why are we doing this? We are doing this to really become more aware of uh, how transition is, is and can be uh, taught and can be debated in the schools and in informal settings in our countries while using the incredible opportunity to have a sort of a cross-border angles. That's why we are inviting you to a series of podcasts, Transition Dialogues, uh, in which we will dialogue about uh, three important topics. Now we are inviting you to listen to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast Crime and Punishment, Transitional Justice in post-communist countries. Uh, so we are going to talk today about transitional justice in Eastern Europe 
and uh, specifically about crime and punishment. And uh, I have always uh, asked myself how relevant is this problem today and whether the question of transitional justice is only theoretical and, and historical question or it could explain somehow the events and the developments in our countries right now. Uh, and I think it will be a good idea to compare the experience of two different countries, Poland, uh, represented by Stanislav, who is, uh, uh, because Poland was one, it, at least from Bulgarian point of view, it was always regarded as a very positive example with regard to the transitional justice. While here in Bulgaria, we have always thought of ourselves, and I think it is also a truth, uh, that Bulgaria lacked, lacked behind Central Europe with regard to transitional justice. So I think the first important question that uh, we should try to address is uh, the question about political background, collapse of communism in our respective countries, in Poland and in Bulgaria, and how representative is the experience of those countries with regard to other countries in uh, Eastern European region. Uh, so Stanislav, please, okay. if you can explain the Polish example, I would be very grateful. Okay, thank you very much, Momshil, for this introduction. And I, I will also start with two um, very short, brief uh, introductory uh, points. The first is that difference between um, my and uh, my, and 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 um, Momshil's point of view is not only the difference between two countries, but also two generations. As uh, Momchil, you are uh, the part of, uh, uh, you, you, of, of, of of transition in Bulgaria. Me, I am the um, representative of the generation that was already born in the free Poland, in the Poland. I was born during the transition. And uh, so, so that's also uh, interesting. I'm um, personally, uh, this, this, this uh, subject of crime and punishment uh, is very uh, important to me. And uh, I'm very interested in this uh, um, problem as I'm uh, not only historian, but also, and the second introductory um, um, a point is that you introduce Poland as a model, uh, uh, as a very successful uh, um, example of transitional justice. I would argue with this. Uh, I think that to some extent we can say that, but uh, I think that what is happening in Poland now, uh, well, well, since uh, what has been happening since uh, 2015 uh, is a sign that maybe not everything uh, went very well as for example a polish uh, reform of judiciary is uh, justified by uh, today's ruling party um, by the fact that the uh, decommunization of judiciary uh, was not held or was held uh, insufficiently and um, I think that the most important thing to say is that uh, Polish transition was peaceful transition and the peaceful uh, it was peaceful because of its origin. The origin of Polish transition was not a re revolution, um, was not a, a you know, um, um, outbreak. Oh, uh, social energy, but the talks, roundtable talks uh, uh, of uh, of the early 1989, uh, when the representatives of uh, the leaders of communist uh, party, um, inter alia those who were uh, also responsible for crimes of of of, uh, of uh, communism of 1980s, especially for martial law of 1981. Um, they uh, sat at the same table and talked about the political future of Poland um, with uh, their uh, with their victims, uh, with the leaders of the uh, anti-communist uh, opposition who were sitting in uh, who, uh, who were held in prison like two three years um, before. So this was a kind of paradox. And this successful um, outcome of, 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 of this roundtable talks led uh, in 
in brief uh, to formation of uh, of of first uh, of, of first government with non-communist prime minister uh, the the the, uh, the representative of of opposition Tadeusz Mazowiecki but in this first um let's say non-communist prime ministers uh, government the, there were still representatives of communists so the uh, communists uh, the communist leader were invited to the new political elites of the free, third republic so it was totally different um, than uh, in Romania, uh, the case of Ceausescu, or in Czech Republic, or in um, the, 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 then in uh, Eastern Germany, uh, which were the countries where the decommunization of the political elites was uh, was held, and they were removed in some some ways, some legal ways, from the political life for some. Uh, some uh, period of time, for example, in Czech Republic till, and how this political grounds uh, defines this transitional justice in, in your country. I remember very well that in the 90s, uh, when the transition in Bulgaria was uh, moving uh, very, very slowly, we have always talked that uh, the most positive examples for us and examples that we should have followed were the examples of Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic. We haven't thought about Germany, Eastern Germany, because it, at that time it was already part, it has already became part of unified uh, Germany. Uh, so uh, uh, there are different, there are similarities between Bulgaria, Bulgarian case and Polish case, and there are also differences. First, the differences, to me, it is important that uh, uh, the communism in Bulgaria collapsed with the resignation of the Bulgarian dictator Todor Zhivkov on 10th of November 1989. Uh, and this event, this news was extremely sudden. No one expected it to happen because uh, he has already been, been in power almost 30 years. Uh, so it was a, a sudden shock change. At that time, already in Bulgaria existed certain, uh, certain. at that time they were called informal organizations, dissident organizations. Uh, they were relatively vocal, but uh, I couldn't say that they were extremely influential. Uh, so uh, this uh, resignation of Todor Zhivkov, it was regarded as a sort of a palace coup as an attempt of the Bulgarian Communist Party to regain the political initiative. Uh, but very quickly it became clear that uh, it cannot keep the political initiative and that the anti-communist forces that quickly unified themselves into a, a big political party, they became important political actor. Another variable which is extremely important was that the last crime perpetrated by the communist regime in Bulgaria in the late 80s. Otherwise, uh, after the collapse of communism, the first steps taken by Bulgaria, they were quite similar with uh, steps taken in Poland. Of course, a little bit later, but actually we were trying to follow the Polish example. There was a round table which was convoked between former communists and uh, anti-communist parties. Uh, it was absolutely the same on, around this round table were sitting people who were perpetrators and who were victims. Uh, and uh, the final result, and I think this is important and successful, was that uh, also Bulgaria was in the verge of a civil war in the, in the early 1990. It succeeded to escape it and finally it, uh, the Bulgarian transition was uh, really peaceful. Uh, and I think this, uh, this is important because it uh, also should be taken into account when we're talking about exactly about transitional justice. Uh, but uh, unlike Poland, for example, in Bulgaria, the opening of the archives of the former state security uh, happened too late. In Bulgaria, it happened in 2007. Uh, and at that time, it was also, it was already impossible to uh, 
uh, it was impossible to, to have a real communization, meaning limiting the political rights of certain people because they were part of the state security or they were, they were, they were part of the political decision body of the former Communist Party. Uh, so the former elite remained strong and at a certain point emerged a kind of conspiratorial theory. It's not only conspiratorial, it's, all, it's, all, it's also a fact uh, that the former communists succeeded to change, to transform their political power into economical power. I understand very well that uh, the reason for this are wider political processes. Uh, but uh, uh, the important point here is that the former communist elite remained influential throughout the 90s and it remained uh, uh, political active uh, during all that period. Okay, I, I may say that um, maybe um, there, there are less um, differences than, than we expected. Uh, um, till, till till this point, because because in Poland uh, it was the same. Uh, the the uh, former communists uh, formed also very influential and very well economically rooted a political force um, called so Social Democratic Party of Poland, and they uh, came into uh, power uh, two times uh, in the 90s and in early um, 2000s, uh, in, in the first years of the new, new century. And when it comes to this um, decommunization problem, uh, um, I may say that in Poland, uh, the broad decommunization happened in the first years uh, of a uh, new uh, Polish state only when it comes to uh, when it comes to the um, the the security um, security uh, the, the secret police members. Okay, um, and uh, it was provoked by the fact that the security police was dissolved and in order to uh, be a worker uh, or a policeman of the new security police forces you needed to be verified um, by the commissions that were uh, that were composed uh, in majority by the um, opposition uh, anti-communist opposition members that about one third uh, of the uh, of the secret police uh, um, secret for police members um, uh, soldiers were uh, dismissed in 1990 so i think that it is a it is a high uh, number of them and, and 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 the majority of those who were really into the political cases uh, were dismissed were not allowed to serve anymore to the free um, in poland so i think that was very good step uh, at the beginning but what um, uh, but but the um, the similar um, the similar move was not, for example, uh, was not, for example, um, done uh, when it comes to judges uh, in Poland. And this uh, problem is still politically important uh, till now, because as I, I mentioned, uh, this is still brought uh, to the political debate by the um, uh, right-wing party that is at the power now uh, since 2015 that there was not a decommunization of, uh, of, 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 of justice in Poland. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I think that this is an important uh, question, of course, uh, uh, because if you, if you want to introduce the rule of law, you need to have the good apparatus for this and um, only uh, only uh, less than 100 of judges were um, dismissed um, disciplinary uh, in 1990s uh, or they were uh, or, or they were uh, denied the right to the pension um, this was a sanction and this was only uh, those still living uh, Mm, judges who were responsible for very, very uh, bad, very, very uh, violent uh, death penalties of the uh, 1950s. But those who were uh, sentencing people 
uh, in uh, during the martial law, um, in majority were not punished and were not uh, disbarred. Uh, um, and it was, and I think it is a problem. It is a problem, and uh, I, I would like to um, I would like to pay attention to this because uh, there is a strong juxtaposition between Poland and Germany, for example, in, when it comes to this fact. In Germany, the uh, attitude toward the um, judges, and but not only judges, uh, generally public function uh, pu pu public functionaries uh, who were uh, acting legally. Uh, when it comes to the communist law, but unlawfully when it comes to the human rights and when it comes to the general general European standards of uh, justice, uh, like for example those uh, soldiers who are shooting to the people escaping from the eastern to uh, western Berlin, uh, they were uh, they were found guilty and sentenced for very long um, sentences. Uh, according to general principles of human rights, okay? Uh, it, it, this is this German attitude, this very harsh attitude. Um, Polish attitude was quite different because in po Polish uh, attitude was in majority of cases that if somebody did not break the law, the communist law, for example, in 1980s, while, for example, being a judge and and, and sentencing uh, the opposition um, activists protesting against the the the, the uh, communist uh, the communist um, regime, uh, he, he he was not found guilty by the uh, by the um, new Poland uh, courts, and it is controversial. I think uh, it is very much controversial. And uh, some cases I think that might, might be uh, seen as, uh, as uh, outrageous uh, why some people was not uh, sentences, uh, sentenced in this way. So maybe you have some uh, similar cases uh, when it comes to your country of, of such a uh, such kind of uh, uh, of, of um, court criminal uh, trials. So yes, thank you very much. I think, uh, or surprisingly to me, I must say uh, here we have also a similarity uh, because uh, in Bulgaria as well, uh, in the early 90s, part of the personnel of the state security was uh, uh, fired or retired. Uh, I'm not sure about the exact percentage, but for sure it's higher than 20%. Uh, but those people in quite a lot of significant cases, they became part of the new, let's say, business elite. So uh, they have used their old connections uh, and their old networks for their personal gains. Uh, and uh, People knew that very well, and uh, those were the years of the 90s when the living conditions in Bulgaria were uh, getting worse and worse. And it was exactly at that time that people started to be, how to say, to some extent, disillusioned with uh, the whole enthusiasm around collapse of communism, uh, which, which initially was uh, very strong. Uh, so the effect of all of this was that uh, in Bulgaria, there were several important trials against former communist officials. Uh, but most of them, most of those trials were unsuccessful and only few of them were successful. And uh, those people were convicted, but for a very short uh, period of time. Uh, but the most uh, uh, spectacular failure was uh, the trial against Todor Zhivkov uh, and although people at that time expected that who would be sentenced for, uh, let's say, some sort of political political crimes, as for example, there was an idea that Bulgaria should have become a uh, 16th Republic of the Soviet Union. It was an idea developed during the 60s, which became well known in the 90s. Uh, but he was not uh, trialed, he was not sentenced, and uh, uh, he was not uh, investigated for those crimes. He was investigated for corruption and embezzle embezzlement. Uh, initially, he was uh, convicted, but finally he was acquitted. And uh, uh, that was the first sign of uh, some sort of a disappointment 
of the Bulgarian public with regard to the transitional justice. And the other important trial was the one against perpetrators, political and uh, executioners, if I can say, of the so-called revival process against the Bulgarian Turks. And this trial also was uh, not successful. Uh, there were several successful cases. The most important and the most famous one was the so-called Chernobyl case. Uh, and since this podcast is addressed to young people, it might be interesting to them to remember that uh, when Chernobyl nuclear power plant, plant uh, exploded, there was, uh, uh, how to say, uh, nuclear rain or uh, uh, rain with radiation, uh, radiation cloud that came also to Bulgaria. And uh, since it was uh, in May, all uh, children, for example, they were doing their uh, regular outdoor activities and no one in Bulgaria was saying and uh, uh, trying to 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 prevent uh, uh, to prevent the public from going outside or to warn the public that there is a problem. Uh, so uh, this case was brought to the court, and finally, two people, the sanitary inspector at that time and the vice uh, prime minister, who was responsible for. Uh, for uh, natural disasters, they were convicted, all, all, although they were convicted to serve uh, uh, only one or two years in uh, prison. And the other case which was successful was uh, another famous case is the, fate, the killing of Bulgarian dissident writer Georgi Markov, who was killed in London in the 70s. Uh, by a Bulgarian uh, state security uh, operative. Uh, the writer was killed with so-called Bulgarian umbrella. Actually, it was a pistol hidden in the umbrella. Uh, so this was, uh, this was the case that was very famous during the Cold War. And in the 90s, uh, when people started to look for the archives in the state security, it emerged that those uh, archives were destroyed and they were destroyed by the uh, by uh, the chief of the intelligence in uh, the 1990. So finally he was brought to trial and he was sentenced to serve uh, in, in prison and he served in prison for 18 months for destruction of uh, the file of uh, uh, Georgi Markov. But actually, that's the whole uh, that's the whole story of successful cases when we are talking about uh, successful trials against former communist officials, and when we are talking about successful cases of transitional justice. Actually, the record of Bulgaria in this respect is not very uh, positive, and the reason I think you're exactly you're uh, absolutely right that the reason behind this is the lack of uh, uh, lack of change in the judicial. Maybe we should move to a conclusion. So may I only add one thing? Yeah, uh, sure. You? Um, that, uh, of course, I, I, I did not um, um, talk about all the uh, cases, but I, I like to be precise, I, may, I must say that while um, in Poland, uh, the, 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 the trials against the communist leaders were also unsuccessful. They were even unfinished. Uh, for example, the trial of Jaruzelski, the, 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 the communist party leader who introduced the martial law and ended the solidarity revolution in, in 1981. It was unfinished when he died. Um, but there were some successful uh, trials against the functionaries uh, of the, 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 the policemen who were uh, shooting uh, to the uh, minors protesting against the uh, this this martial law, um, it took a lot of time uh, to convict them, but they were found guilty and were sent to prison in uh, the early 21st um, century. But the problem was not only the lack of the uh, change in, in in of of judges because they were many good decent judges also in in communism i don't have uh, time to, to talk a, a lot about this 
I wrote a book about this. It was very interesting. Um, but the problem also were the evidence was the evidence uh, because uh, the, the lack of the evidence. Okay, for example, these um, these uh, those those policemen shooting to the minors, protesting minors were not uh, were convicted after the third trial. Uh, because in the two uh, trials, two first trials, they, they were acquitted not because they were not guilty, but because of the lack of the evidence. Because the evidence was um, was, as you mentioned, um, as you mentioned, uh, uh, it was um, uh, crushed by the communists. It was uh, it vanished. Um, so uh, the third, the, the third. Um, um, the third uh, trial was successful only because the new evidence uh, was found, and this new evidence was the testimony of two uh, alpinists, two Polish alpinists who were training those policemen like a few months after this massacre, and those, uh, those uh, policemen told them the truth, and they, after, after many, many years, they decided to um, to, to, to tell it to the court and court uh, found those uh, testimonies decisive uh, to, uh, to um, convict them. So uh, in some uh, times this, uh, this way, this path of the justice were uh, not very straight, but finally, uh, uh, finally the justice was, uh, was done. So not in every case the justice was not done. <laughs> I would like to, it to be on the record here. My question is, do you think that we can have simultaneously peaceful transition? Because I think peaceful transition in our countries is the most important accomplishment. Uh, but uh, can we have simultaneously peaceful transition and the real transitional justice? Uh, what's the lack of transitional justice or ineffective, maybe it's more correct to say, ineffective transitional justice, the price that we have paid for uh, the peaceful transition? Uh, what do you think about such provocation, uh, if it is a provocation, of course? Mm -hmm. of, uh, thank you for this question. I think that yes, we can uh, we can uh, reconcile those two values, but uh, uh, but only while uh, while admitting that it will not be possible to convict every guilty to 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 find uh, to 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 to, to uh, execute the justice uh, very radically because it always. You know, um, it uh, when you when you are um, you, you have to you have to make choices in the politics <laughs> and in the uh, in especially in such a such a very important um, breakthrough as transitions and uh, the, the the choice, for example, to find. Uh, uh, to make a deal with the communists implied the fact that uh, they were not, for example, prosecuted just afterwards. And I think that this, this was the price that, uh, that was uh, calculated and it was well calculated. But um, still, uh, I think that uh, having this in, keeping this in mind, uh, we could uh, do better in in transitional justice. We can, you know, when it comes to especially these uh, these criminal trials, uh, uh, we our state. I, I speak about Polish state could uh, could do uh, do better, do uh, be more effective, and if more resources were uh, put in this uh, in this in this problem. Thanks a lot. I must say that I completely, uh, uh, so first I must admit that I have uh, speculated with the idea from time to time uh, that uh, uh, ineffective transitional justice is really the price, that the price that we paid for the peaceful transition and that this peaceful transition was a real accomplishment. Uh, but I must say that uh, thinking more and more about this, I completely agree with you that uh, it's a question of uh, institutions, of uh, if you want, of administration. 
uh, and uh, it's not only uh, I, I mean I understand that uh, in the early 90s for example or in the 90s in general there was lack of political will or due to different circumstances uh, for investigation of those crimes. But I must admit also that it was not also, uh, it was not only lack of political will, it was also ineffectiveness of administration, of institutions. And I think this is one of the main lessons that we have learned since uh, admission into European Union that actually administration, institutions, are extremely important. And right now, of course, uh, more and more in Bulgaria, we are talking about uh, rule of law, whether it exists, whether it doesn't exist. Uh, but finally, we have started to realize that this concept of rule of law, which in the 90s, it looked to us very abstract thing. We didn't know what does it mean. Right now, it became very, uh, how to say, uh, if I can say, uh, uh, visible, uh, actual, and uh, uh, right now we know that this concept of rule of law is not only uh, an abstraction, it is uh, the way that uh, our life is ordered, and uh, I think this is one of the important uh, lessons uh, from the transitional justice and from the ineffectiveness of transitional justice, just in the case of Bulgaria. Thanks a lot. This podcast was part of a Transition Dialogue project. Transition Dialogue, dealing with change in democratic ways. The project is financed by the Federal Agency for Civic Education as uh, implemented by a consortium of partners, um, including Sofia Platform from Bulgaria, Stiftung Wissen am Werk, and Institute of Social Sciences, Ivo Pilar from Croatia, Open Lithuania Foundation from Lithuania, Center for Citizenship Education from Poland, a Congress of Cultural Activists from Ukraine, and the Museum of the Victims of uh, Totalitarianism from Perm, Russia. Our common work is coordinated by Deutsch-Russischer Austausch, from Berlin.